And we're back, everybody. Yes, thank you, thank you. Yes. I thought I would stop making videos, but I am so sorry to disappoint. So, um, it's long, long story short, HVAC symposium to AHR to catching up on work things to now back to making videos. Today's a good one. Um, I'm not going to lie. I have not uh, uncovered this one or even discussed it a whole lot, um, even with my internal people. So, let me paint you a picture for today's uh, lesson. VRV4, uh, heat recovery, we're talking about REYQ144, 120, they all kind of share the same footprint and the same size and capacity. A lot of you guys may see this and understand it as something that looks a lot like this. Oh, that's a weird way to do it. Here we go. Ta-da. This is your REYQ144 TATJU. Now, we look at all this stuff. Oh, my, oh my gosh. This is an insane amount of stuff on this diagram here. Uh, refrigerant receiver right here. Um, that's your liquid receiver in the back left. You've got your two compressors here, kind of front right. And then here we have our beautiful accumulator, Mr. B10, right? This nice little round device. And so what does an accumulator do, you might ask? Well, an accumulator is designed to store and hold liquid refrigerant that might make it back to the compressor. It's not designed to store it. It's designed to catch it as a safety device, right? So we have vapor coming down the suction line back out to the compressor. And instead of making it to the compressor for liquid compression, what happens is it falls down into the bottom of this accumulator. I actually have a beautiful cutaway out to post some photos of. Um, and at the base of that accumulator, right, it fills up with liquid to the tippy top. And then on the other side, the leaving side, it pulls vapor out of the top of the accumulator back to the compressor. So what does it allow it to do? It allows liquid refrigerant that might make it back to the compressor, stores it in a tank, allows it to boil off into a vapor, and then it pulls that vapor off the top of the tank back to the compressor. It's great. It's a safety device. And I love it because it keeps us from compressing liquid. However, what happens on a system, and this happens all the time, that isn't maintained properly and the maintenance has gone out the window. Either someone says they're doing it and they're not doing it or they, they don't understand the technology and so they're not checking all the boxes like they should be checking. Um, and so it goes down the road and down the road. And so here we have a seven-year-old VRV4 system um, that has now had enough failures inside to start to fill the accumulator. And so what does that look like? Well, that looks like wet operation. So you look at the service checker data here. On my screen, I have your compressor suction pipe temperature and your evaporation temperature. Now, these two things together give me my suction superheat, one of the three pillars that I've always loved to talk about. And you'll notice here it kind of starts off okay, and then we go right into wet operation. Well, how do we know that's wet operation? Well, because if this is my saturation temperature of refrigerant right on the suction line, when those two lines touch, that is liquid refrigerant. And the great thing about this system is that I have essentially um, an accumulator in line, but this compressor suction pipe temperature thermistor is right at the compressor inlet. So anything leaving the accumulator back to my compressor is measured. And as you can see, we get very close, if not on the money here, with my suction pipe temperature matching my evaporation temperature, which means that my compressor is compressing liquid. And we can also see that when we start to compress liquid, you'll notice that my, my discharge temperatures fall, right? They go down. Now, that also may be because, let's just move over here to the right. We can plot that easily right here for both of these. But also, we could just make sure that we don't change speeds. And we don't. So that's also important. You can notice here, I don't need this one because that compressor is not running. But here you go, right? So when we start compressing liquid, you'll notice that. Even though we don't have a speed change, what happens? My discharge temperature rises because of unlubricated operation. So you see we're flooding here. And then it floods and it floods and it floods. And so what happens, right? Compressor gets somewhat cooled, colder, right? Discharge temp falls. And then based upon the severity of the flooding, if it continues, we start to lose oil at a drastic level. And that starts to turn into this, where the discharge temperatures climb and they climb and they climb. And then you'll notice here, Right Then we have this huge dip right between the suction temp and also saturation temp. And you'll notice here, then it falls down. Again, we haven't changed compressor speed. This blue line is my compressor speed for this module. And so now 
we're going and we're falling and we're falling and we're falling. And now my discharge temperature is 167. Now, if I compare it to the 116 here, I'm not below the threshold for discharge superheat. However, liquid compression is liquid compression. It is still a very, very bad thing. Now, this just tells me because this hasn't plummeted to 30 to, to 100 and uh, what is it? 116 degrees that it's not a ton of liquid refrigerant, but still some is worse than none, right? We don't want any liquid refrigerant getting back to our compressor. But this story isn't about compressing liquid. This is about accumulators. Okay, so we've got this giant accumulator in the system. Great, love it. It's blue, matches the color of the unit, right? Made by Emerson, awesome. Okay, it's flooding, which tells me the accumulator is overflowing with liquid. And, and the reason we know that is because it does, liquid doesn't just go down in and then, and then slosh up to the top and then eject out the top of the suction line. No, it doesn't. <laughs> the only way to get liquid out of the accumulator is for the accumulator to be full of liquid. And how does that happen? Well, if we take a nice little jog down here inside the building, do, 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 nice little walk here. We'll find a right here, indoor unit number three. Window unit number three is one of five indoor units that is actually flooding liquid refrigerant by. How do we know that? Because if we look at these two temperatures, they are very close together at zero pulses, right? And you say, well, the temperature goes up. No, it doesn't actually go up. Now, you'll notice it changes from heat mode to cooling mode as we go through this data. However, this is a clear indication over time that these temperatures do not change. More so, this unit is flooding by because I can also take these two temperatures here and compare it to my saturation temperature. My saturation temperature is 37.4. And the fact that this temperature remains a constant over time, not just in this data snippet, over time, um, and it matches between one to three degrees of my TE. And as my TE drops, so does my coil temperature. That tells me that the, the, the similarities, that the connection between the two means that there's liquid refrigerant flowing through this coil at zero pulses, right? This is flood back. This times five will fill an accumulator with liquid refrigerant over time. You remember that device that I showed you, right? Where we're supposed to have liquid refrigerant Oh, here it is right here. This is our liquid receiver assembly. This is where the system is supposed to store liquid refrigerant in the system. However, when liquid refrigerant bypasses a heat exchanger, which is what's happening, it's bypassing the heat exchanger, where does the liquid refrigerant end up? Well, it tries to make it back to the compressor, but it doesn't make it very far because guess what? We've got our buddy old pal here, Mr. Accumulator, right? He's going to take the bullet for us. So he's going to start storing and stacking liquid refrigerant where it should be over here in case we need it at low load. Instead, in low load, it's here because it's bypassing heat exchangers and making it down the suction line. Well, once this guy fills up to the top and he can't hold any more, what happens? What well, comes back out of the top here on this channel? Oh, let me just draw you, draw you a beautiful little picture here, okay? Right, all right. So right here, it comes into the accumulator. Boom, right? And that what that does, what does that do? That ejects it down into the bottom of the actual connector. Oh, here we go. There's follow these jagged lines here. There we go. Okay. That blows it down into the tank. This is also where we have the issue where liquid refrigerant, uh, not liquid refrigerant, sorry, hot gas coming down the suction line because of the direction of where it comes in at, it blows down onto this soft plug on the side. So if you get uh, hot gas or close to 158, 164 degrees, that's where this soft plug right here on the side actually blows. It's blowing down on it in the accumulator. That's what it's designed for. So if hot gas comes down into the accumulator and it blows down on this plug on that wall, because actually if you look at this, it's designed to shoot it to the left here and hit that wall and then dissipate down into the space. They're trying to keep it away from the outlet, which is this one here. So once the liquid or refrigerant in this accumulator, let's change gears from hot gas, soft plugs blowing, that's what this video is about. It is about accumulators. And let's talk about accumulators filling up. So this accumulator is full now with liquid refrigerant. So where does it start to go? Well, it starts to bubble up. And so you get vapor that comes in, right? Refrigerant still flowing in here. A little bit of liquid, a little bit of gas flows out of here. It blows it back over here and it starts to go into my compressors. You'll notice here that we have a temperature thermistor right here. This is your compressor suction temp. Oh, actually, sorry, it's right here. There we go. Compressor suction temp right there. This is for, for vibration. Um, that compressor suction temperature is telling me, leaving my accumulator, I have liquid refrigerant. So it is 
full, right? That's the only explanation that we have here. If we have refrigerant that is at saturation temperature, right, in the suction line, at the compressor, and it's gone through the accumulator because it's the only physical way it can go, that is a full accumulator. There's no way for that liquid to finagle its way around, even at a high flow, to make it back up out of the top of the accumulator unless it is spilling over at the top. Um, okay, so we know we have wet operation. I showed you what wet operation looks like. If you're this far into the video series and you don't know what a wet operation is, go back to some other videos and catch back up. We have wet operation. Okay, but this is the part that separates the boys from men, right? Understanding this fact, when an accumulator is full of liquid and that liquid is making it back to the compressor because of issues within the system, when you correct those issues on the system, it takes time to empty that accumulator before wet operation goes away. I'm going to say that again, okay? Liquid refrigerant, when it fills the accumulator to the top, Tippy tippy top, right? This is probably close to 25 pounds, if not 30 pounds of liquid refrigerant. That's a lot of refrigerant. Okay, so what happens over time when we fix the bleed back, right? We fix liquid bypassing heat exchangers on the system, right? Went out there, found all five. I happen to have all five EEVs on my truck. I changed them all by the end of today. And I look at the data and I go, what the F? right? There's still flood back on my compressor. So I look at all the indoor units and I look at everything again and I'm second guessing my decision. I'm second guessing my, my decisions in life. Why did I decide to do VRF? Um, my gosh, maybe I should go back to servicing PTAX. Uh, I hope that wasn't your past. Uh, maybe I did it too. So it's okay. Um, and you're like, man, I, I should just quit, right? I'm going to quit now because apparently I didn't fix anything and I spent all day doing it. Take a deep breath. Okay. Watch breathing exercises. Ready? <sighs> Okay, you feel better? I feel better. My brain's more oxygenated. Now I can talk faster. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, but why, right? Why is there still liquid refrigerant coming back to my compressor? And that's because you have 30 pounds of liquid refrigerant that now has to do what? It has to boil off, and that takes time to chip away at that total charge in the accumulator until it gets low enough that it no longer affects your suction temps. So what does that look like? Let's look. So we're going to go through this, and I'm going to do some really fast scrolling. And you're going to see, okay, it got better here, right, because we, we fixed one EEV, maybe two. Uh, my team, brilliant guys, working on it. Here they go, right? They're moving. They're going, right? We're going to see some maybe some oil returns here, some defrost. Okay, that's still pretty wet. Let's keep going. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, now again, we, we fixed all five, so we're good, except for maybe one, right? Maybe they ran out, okay? But they got, they got the worst ones. Okay, look at that. Wait a minute. Okay, here we go. So if we go back and we time the change to now, and, and we're, let's say you're asking now the question, okay, Roman, you told me accumulators, they fill with liquid refrigerant, and I can't check the data until it empties. When the F does it empty? Well, it depends upon your compressor speeds. If you're running at low load, and you're at 30% compressor speed, and I'm tossing numbers at you really quick here because I did the math. It takes one to two hours at low speed to empty an accumulator on a VRV system before the wet operation goes away. So if you fix the problem and you're still looking for a solution, it could take up to two hours before you see that change take place on your system operational data. Your discharge super is still going to be high because it's scrubbing the oil out of your compressors. Your suction super is going to be low because the accumulator is still trying to empty itself before we get there. VRV3, we don't have this problem because there are no accumulators. VRV4, we added the accumulator and on. And so this is something we have to understand. And so we're going, and wait a minute, wait a minute, we're getting some traction here. Wait a minute, look at my suction superheat. It's starting to drift apart, and it gets better, and it gets better, and it gets better, and it gets a little worse. But guess what? The little engine that could... We missed one. It's okay. And we ran out of expansion valves. It happens. But look at this suction superheat now, right? This is a decent suction superheat. Nowhere do I see these lines touching outside of oil return mode or defrost. Look at it. That's a beautiful line distance right there, okay? So what does this tell me? This tells me that now that I've made the changes on the system, right? I found problems. I found liquid refrigerant bypassing heat exchangers. I made a change for the better, okay? 
I waited because I understand what an accumulator does and how much refrigerant it can hold until I actually see the change that I made take effect in the system once the liquid refrigerant in that accumulator boils off and leaves the accumulator. Now there's only vapor in the accumulator, maybe a little bit of liquid at the bottom. Hey, it happens, right? It's VRV. It's not perfect. Uh, it's not rocket science either. But this is a solid suction superheat. This now tells me my accumulator has completely emptied. And you saw those lines. They got, they got, they were close, and then they got further apart, further apart, further apart, and then they stopped drifting and they sat right where they should sit. And that is somewhere close to what is that? Uh, less than 20, 18 degree suction superheat. It's not bad, right? Uh, I'll take that all day long. 18, 20, 25, you know, somewhere around there. But again, it's not zero. It was zero and it was killing compressors. This system has eaten three compressors. And before that, it probably ate another four. And so all because of a lack of maintenance, right? This comes back to maintenance. But as service technicians, when you're making these repairs, you're, you're, you're touching these systems, you're looking at the operational data. Remember, nothing happens at the drop of a hat, right? Nothing happens in a quick manner of seconds. No, it doesn't. But now that you know there's an accumulator on this system and what it does when I have wet operation and it's a sensor after the accumulator that tells me it's full, right? Now I have to empty it in order to get there, get to the point where it's not flooding back anymore. Now, could I empty this faster? Probably. I could probably put it in this heading mode 2.6 and get it to ramp way the heck up there. Um, but outside of that, like there's not a whole lot else to do except for be patient and understand that the changes you made take time to take effect on the system and the overall data, right? So again, this is a, a love story about liquid refrigerant and it's um, a fascination with compressors, okay? But this is a happy ending here, guys, okay? We, we got liquid refrigerant, we kept it away, right? It's the toxic relationship that compressors, they want to be a part of, but they should have nothing to do with it because it ruins their lives. Uh, and they end up dead. I mean, that's really the, that's every, you know, love story, at least I know of in uh, what, in our, they teach us in English class, right? But at the end of the day, we found what killed this compressor. We made the change that needed to take place. And then we viewed the operational data to find a positive impact on the system from the changes that we made. That's our job, guys. You find a dead compressor. You look at the data. You fix the problem that is killing the compressor. And then you verify the changes you made are, are all the changes that should be made to get to the end solution that is something like this, right? Now this system is going to live a long, happy life. We're actually filtering it right now as we speak and getting all the contaminants out of the system. Um, but this is accumulators on VRV equipment and also what to look for when we are troubleshooting data live in the field, understanding that there are other limiting factors on what we see and how it impacts the data we also see and how we troubleshoot. So there you go. See you guys in a few.